having me. Thank you for tolerating me, allowing me to come. Thank you, Faith Tabernacle, for being so responsive last night. You made my night. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, brethren, for preaching to me. Thank you, Lord, for touching our hearts. Praise God. Turn to your neighbor, shake their hand, and say, this is another good day to live for God. To the book of Joshua, chapter number 24, we are going to read, beginning at verse number 29, and read down through verse number 31. I have not preached a thing in the, these last two services. Thank you, Brother Evans. I have not preached a thing that I came thinking that I was going to preach. And this morning, um, rising early and seeking after the will of God, this is what seems to be the will of God for me to speak this morning. So from the book of jo uh, Joshua chapter 24 and verse number 29, Joshua 24 and verse number 29, and it came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being an hundred and ten years old. I want you to notice how they describe this man of God, this servant of the Lord. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Sarah, which is in Mount Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gash. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua, which had known all the works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Joshua, the servant of the Lord, is dead. And Israel serves the Lord, evidently, faithfully, evidently with desire, evidently with interest in pleasing God, all the days, all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua. And so the indication from the Word, and I will not take the time this morning because it is not necessarily my subject, but the indication is that when the elders ceased to be in their life, that they ceased to serve the Lord. My subject this morning for your consideration is very simple. It's God preserve the elders. Let's pray that prayer. God, we want you to preserve the ministry in this church. We want you to preserve the apostolic ministry upon the earth. Until you come, Lord, you have promised that you have built a church, established it, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But God, you've placed in our lives men, men called of your name, sanctified and sent. I pray, God, that you would help us today with utterance to hear the heartbeat of the Lord. Strengthen this congregation in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The elder, according to the word of the Lord, entails at least two definitions that are very prominent. First of all, there is the aged man or the individual who has weathered enough life to qualify as an elder. I'm not there yet, but I'm getting there. And uh, my wife says she's tired of hearing me talk about it. I know you wouldn't believe it, but I'm only 34 years of age. You don't believe it? Okay. Actually, I'm 44. I'm young, but I am on my way to becoming an aged individual. The alternatives are not very uh, attractive at this moment. I'm kind of enjoying the journey. The second usage of the word in the word of the Lord is one that depicts an individual that has a specialized distinction and touch of God upon his life. Joshua chapter 23 and verse number 2, thank you. And verse number 2, when Joshua is calling all the people of God together to give them his last instruction and to call them to serve the Lord, the Bible said, And Joshua called for all Israel and for their elders, their heads, their judges, their officers, and said unto them, I am old and stricken in age. He calls these men. These are men that have a special distinction. These are men that are recognized by the people of God, that have gifts of leadership, that have gifts of wisdom, that have gifts of justice and righteous 
judgment. They are set apart by the hand of God to administer His will, His purpose, and to guide the people of God into all the ways that would please the Lord. The Hebrew word is shotram, and uh, it describes a man that has been blessed, anointed of the Lord. In the book of Numbers, chapter 11 and verse number 25, when God's plan was placed in the heart of men, He said to Moses, His servant, He said, I am going to take your spirit, and I am going to put it upon 70 men. And the Scripture calls these men elders. And 70 elders were anointed by the Lord. And they prophesied. And the Spirit of the Lord God came upon them. And they became a great help to God's people. It was more than just being an old man sitting in the gate. It was more than just being a man who had lived long enough to qualify for a gray beard, but it was men upon whom the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. I want to pause long enough to say that I believe that age is not the important factor in whether or not an elder is an elder in the will of God. In this meeting, there have been some young men upon whom the hand of the Lord has rested. There has been the favor of God upon men. Your pastor, while not uh, very old in age, perhaps uh, the youngest of us preachers here, I'm not really sure, but I think so, uh, the hand of the Lord is upon him. And he is an elder anointed by God. And I believe that the continuity of this apostolic message has got to be placed in the heart of men and that God has got to give to this church, but only to the church in general and at large. But God has got to place in this church men upon whom His Spirit can rest. It is my sincere desire. I don't know if this is right or wrong, but it is my sincere desire. And I have prayed this prayer consistently in the almost 17 years that I've pastored in the same location. And that is, God, I want you to tie the the men that come into this church into the ministry. The 11th chapter of Numbers and the 29th verse tells us that 68 of the men that the Spirit of the Lord God came upon were outside of the camp with Moses, where the Lord was blessing them. But two men were inside the camp. And the Bible said that they prophesied. And uh, here came a young man running to Moses saying, Oh, by the way, there's somebody inside the camp in there, and they're prophesying. And he called them by name, and Moses made this statement. He said that would that all of God's people were anointed to prophesy. I believe there's got to be in our heart a desire. And I just want to throw this in this morning. There's got to be in the heart of the apostolic ministry to reproduce itself. There's got to be somebody that rises up standing in the shadow of an apostolic pastor, a preacher. I kind of feel directed a little bit this way this morning. And I just want to say to you men that are gathered in this house, draw nigh to your pastor. Get as close as you can. Hear everything he's got to say. Go with him to the prayer room. Follow him when he does the work of the Lord. Do everything you can and ask God to be favorable enough to you to place in your life the same kind of a spirit that he's put upon your pastor. Amen? Amen? Greeley, Colorado needs more than one apostolic church. I didn't say Pentecostal church. I said apostolic church. You may not feel that way, and if I've crossed you, then I'm wrong and you're right. But I'm going to tell you, I believe that the time that we're living in demands that there be men that have the Spirit of the Lord God in their heart. And I cannot think of a better place for men to be produced for the gospel work than out of a red-hot, apostolic, fearless pastorate, Amen, where men can go forth 
and do the work of the Lord. We need evangelists in this day that know how to touch God. We need pastors in this day that know how to go out, dig out a church out of the rough, pull it up, amen, right out of sin, and present a bride to the Lord Jesus Christ when He comes. Praise God. Praise God. And if somehow I believe that the greatest compliment that a man can be given in his life is for God to raise up men under him and send them forth into the ministry. Well, praise the Lord. But these men had the Spirit of the Lord God that rested upon them. The Bible tells us that they ceased not to prophesy. And they had the favor of God, and they had the favor of men upon them. The King James Version and its translation uses the word. When age is not uh, the determining factor, when it's describing more than an aged man, it uses the word ancient. In the book of Ezra, chapter 3, and verse number 12, is such a word that is used at the dedication of the foundation of the temple that Ezra is to build. And the Bible said that on that day there was rejoicing and there was also weeping. And the intermingling of the two was indistinguishable. There was rejoicing from those that had never seen the former glory of God. But the Bible said that there were some ancient men that had beheld the former glory and had seen the former temple. And they were the ones that were weeping. I just want to make this point to you this morning and say that everything that calls itself church doesn't fit the criteria of church. And everything that calls itself Pentecostal is not necessarily a Jesus name apostolic Pentecostal church. And you need an elder in your life, amen, that can tell the difference. You need an elder that can weep when weeping is demanded. You need an elder that has seen the glory of God and can point the way and say, this is the way we need to go. Praise the Lord. Samuel was such a man that was anointed by the Lord. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Samuel and chapter number 3 and verses 19 and 20 that the Spirit of the Lord God was upon this young man. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan, even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. From the time that he was just a child, from the time that he was a babe, if you please, anointing of the Lord seemed to come upon this man. He was set apart for a purpose. He was a man that God had his hand upon to use mightily. And the Bible lets us to know that all of Israel saw and all of Israel knew that he was ordained to be a prophet of the Lord. That's the kind of elder that I'm talking about tonight. This burden actually was born in my heart. I say this very carefully and very cautiously, but I officiated at the funeral of a man who had at one time been an official in the state that I am residing in. As a matter of fact, he had pastored the church prior to the time that I uh, be assumed the pastorate of that assembly. And when he passed, his funeral was not very well attended. And I thought about that. I took a look at that and said, there's something here that doesn't quite meet the grave. And it started me on this journey that I'm on this morning. Oh, God, give us men that indeed are anointed of the Lord. Not only was the favor of God upon his life, but because of the favor of God, the favor of the people was upon him. Amen. Praise the Lord. There's got to be something in the heart of a man that God places there for people to recognize, for people to want to follow. We're not just involved in following after personalities. 
This is not charisma that we are involved in. This is not the good will of a man and some cultic idea that we have latched onto and we have given a man our allegiance and we're following him just simply because of nothing else to follow. But there is a supernatural touch of God that, that settles upon a man that when you meet him, when you see him, when you feel it, when you get around him, you say there's something about this man that's different. There's something about the message that rings true. There's something about about the heartbeat that I can feel. There's something about the anointing that has gripped my spirit. I'm going to tell you what kind of preachers I like to listen to. I like to listen to the kind of preachers your pastor brings to this pulpit. I like to listen to your pastor preach. I like to listen to men that when they preach, you feel the heartbeat. It makes you set up on the edge of your pew. It makes your jaw get a little tight. It makes your eyes become a little more focused. It makes your mind a little keener because they got something to say and there's an anointing there. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. I can recall, and I'm sure every man that ever feels the touch of God in his life has a similar story. But I can remember as just a young boy, Elder Gross, um, I got the Holy Ghost in a revival preached by Elder Verbal Bean. And uh, he came to our city and absolutely revolutionized the church that uh, we were attending. My father uh, became a real saint of God in that revival. And uh, it was amazing. But I can remember even as a child, just a boy, that I could feel the Spirit of God walking where that man walked. I would lay in my bed at night even as a child and hunger for that. I would hear the stories of, that he would tell of devotion and dedication in his life and consecration and drawing nigh unto God. Something in me would pull me towards that. I gravitated towards that desire. I'm going to tell you something. A real man of God has got that kind of anointing in his life. Amen. A real man of God makes you feel God when he is ministering the things of God. That's the kind of man you've got right here. That's the kind of pastor you've got right here. I'm going to tell you something. You don't understand, and maybe, maybe you do. Maybe I'm not giving you enough credit. But I'm going to tell you, this man is an anointed man. He is a blessed man. I say, God preserve the elder. I say, God preserve the elder. Oh, God preserve the elder. Praise the Lord. It's not an accident that God gave you the property that He gave you. It's not an accident that this building, amen, came into existence. It's not an accident that financially God has placed His hand upon this congregation. And you have done exceeding abundantly above all that you even dreamed would ever take place. It's not an accident that you have what you have and the favor of the Lord upon you. The reason that the favor of the Lord is upon you is because God favored you with an elder. God favored you with a real man of God. God favored you with a man that has his heartbeat. God favored you with a pastor that listens to God. God favored you with a preacher that's not afraid to hear from God and to speak for God. Oh, praise the Lord. The Bible tells us of this man Samuel in the 16th chapter and the 4th verse that he comes on a mission from the Lord to the city of Bethlehem wherein Jesse and the household of, of, uh, of Jesse was and, and David who was to be anointed king of Israel just a ruddy lad keeping the sheep of his father's house. And the Bible said that when that man, that man Samuel, walking down the dusty trail, perhaps a runner, he sees him, somebody out in the field said, oh my goodness, there comes the man of God. And they run to the city. And while Samuel is still a ways off, here come the aged men. And they gather out there. And the Bible says of them that they trembled because the man of God was coming. And the first question out of their mouth was, have you come peaceably? I'm going to tell you, that's recognition of the Spirit of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. When a real man of God stands in the pulpit, it'll make your knees tremble. When a real man of God begins to preach, you're going to ask yourself, you'll search your heart. You'll search your spirit. Is it peacefully? 
has he come peacefully to me tonight? Amen. Am I right with God? I'm telling you, the preaching that we've heard the last few nights, I'm just going to be real honest with you. I've gone back to my room, uh, and a couple of nights I've been unable, unable to fall immediately to sleep, but I have sat there in that room and, and uh, at times taken the Word of God, and, and I have prayed, and I have wept, and said, God, I want my spirit to be right. I want my heart to be right. I want my life to be right. I want to find my Self, God, in the way that these men have preached. The only way that it happens is that God has to preserve the elder. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Kings consulted with the elders. The priests had their position, but there was something about that anointed man. Amen. In the Old Testament, that prophet of the Lord. Amen. That God put his hand upon him. It was a different office than a king. It was a different office than those who fulfilled the ceremonial law. It was a different office than just being the preacher down at our church. I'm going to tell you something that really torques me real bad. As they say down in, in uh, East Texas, it chaps me real well. Hey Amen. That's for folks to introduce me as their preacher. Oh, this is our preacher down at our church. That just, that just crawls up one side of me and down the other side. It's not because I have an ego to feed. Uh, amen. I, I hope I'm beyond that. I really hope I am. But it's because it's something in their spirit that does not say, This is my shepherd. This is my pastor. This is the man of God in my life. This is the man that I am following. When you just got a preacher in your life, amen. Oh, wasn't that good preaching, but you don't feel any obligation to do anything about it. Amen. Your pastor didn't go to a seminary to find out how to pastor. Amen. He came from the back alleys and from the rough roads. And he came from the dives and the joints uh, to an old-fashioned altar, repented of his sins. Uh, and like the Apostle Paul of old, the Lord took him on the backside of the desert uh, and there instructed him and, and guided him and led him. And what you have here tonight or today is not just a preacher. You've got an elder in your life. Uh, I said, you've got an elder in your life. I'm going to tell you that bankers are going to consult with your pastor. I'm going to tell you that city officials will consult with your pastor. I'm going to tell you that there's something that God does to a man in the will of God. Oh, hallelujah. He gives him favor in the city. He gives him favor in the community. He gives him favor. Amen. The devil doesn't like it and tries to stir it up. But that doesn't stop a God-called man. That doesn't stop a real elder. God God's going to shine through. God's going to anoint. God's going to bless. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God preserve the elder. Revelation 4 and 4, there are 20 and 4 elders before the throne of the Lord that worship Him day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Nothing else occupies that position next to the heartbeat of God. Nothing else occupies that place near the throne of the Lord. But the elders occupy that place. It's a special place that God has preserved. I'm going to tell you something today. I believe that God has a special place place in his heart for a real man of God, a man that can weep, a man that can preach, a man that can pray, a man that can seek, a man that can do the work of God, a man that's not selfish, a man that's not self-centered, a man that has the heartbeat of God more than he does his own personal heartbeat. You hear me today, that's the kind of man that God put in this city. Amen. We're celebrating the seventh anniversary of an elder coming to this city. We're celebrating the seventh anniversary of a God-called man, a God-sent man, a God-anointed man. Matthew chapter 16 and 18, when Jesus 
was establishing his church upon the earth, said to the apostle Peter, boy, I feel so much at home right now. I'm telling you, I could just about chew these pews up and spit out splinters the way I feel right now. I feel at home. Hallelujah. And I'm just going to tell you, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. I'm not going to preach four hours today. Well, I can tell who does and who don't. Some of you are saying, all right, preach it. Some of you are saying, my Lord, I hope he doesn't. I won't. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. We're celebrating seven years of an elder. I'm going to tell you the wear and the tear on a man of God is unbelievable. The wear and tear on his family is incomprehensible. You don't understand what it's like. You don't understand till you've been there. I, I, I caught myself the other day, uh, Brother Evans, as I was as I was preparing even to come here. Uh, my flight was not until 11:50 in the in the morning, so that's then that's lots of time. And uh, I took my children to the school. We have a church school, and and I was there early, and I was in my study and. And uh, I knew that I was coming here, and I didn't want to just come and preach sermonettes to Christianettes. And uh, I, have, I didn't just pray the first time then, all right, hallelujah. But uh, I was serious about it, and I want the mind of God. And so I said to myself, self, you can invest the next several hours in, in finding the mind of God. I don't want to go there. I hate going to a meeting. It seems like it's my lot. I'll just confess I hate going there and not even know what's going to happen till I, till I get up and get there. I just I hate that. I wish, I wish that I had whatever it takes to know at least a week in advance what I was going to preach when I got there. I'd sure feel better, I'll tell you that. And so I was, <laughs> so I was, it made me feel good to walk in the office the other night and Brother White had one desk and Brother Alviar had the other desk and, and a few of us were trying to visit and, and they were so aggravated that we are in there because in just a few minutes they're going to be preaching and they're both still scribbling notes. And I said to myself, look at that self, <laughs> you're not the only one. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But uh, I wanted to get alone, and so I locked the door. And, uh, and I, I just locked the door. I didn't even go in the auditorium because there's too much activity and too many people coming and going. I locked the door, and no sooner I got the light down low and got a good touch of the Lord going, and, and I was just about to ask Him things, and here came a pounding on the door. And, uh, and I tried my best to ignore it. And after a while, it went away, and, and uh, then the intercom started buzzing. And, uh, and uh, I couldn't ignore it because it's got that kind that, uh, anyway, that they hear everything going on in there when they're trying to talk to you. So I finally said yes, and, and, uh, and I, I, I told no, I'm, I'm, don't bother me, and punched a button so they couldn't bother me anymore. And, and about the time I thought I was going to get right back into it, here it came again, and somebody else pounding at the door. And, and, uh, and so I said, well, I, Lord, this isn't going to give up. And so I opened the door, and, and I wouldn't let them in. I just stood there a minute, and God bless you, and, here's, and we'll take care of it later, and, and so long. And I just shut the door, and the phone was ringing, and it was urgent. And it was a weeping, 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 precious saint of God that really needed to talk. And so, so I picked up the phone, and I took some time to deal with that, and just put the phone down, and somebody else pounded on the door, and, and, and in my mind, I said this, and I felt a little guilty afterwards, but, but I said, will it never end? And then I thought to myself, it, if it ended, it would be because God took his favor from me, and there wouldn't be these folks here. But you have no idea the pressure that mounts up on a real man of God. I'm going to tell you, I am preaching today, God preserve the elder. 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 God anoint the elder. God bless the elder. God put your hand on the elder. God give him great gifts. God gave him, give him great wisdom. God preserve the elder. The apostolic succession from Matthew 16 and 18, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. From that day to this, I firmly believe and affirm again here this morning that there has been an apostolic church in existence, and the gates of hell have never been able to wipe out the apostolic church. For there to be an apostolic church, there's had to be an apostolic preacher. Amen. Apostolic preachers have come under great fire and intense scrutiny throughout the ages. I, I cannot think of a time when it has ever been that there has not been persecution, ridicule, and great scrutiny of the light of the man of God. The pressure that's brought to bear from hell. The pressure that's brought to bear from society. The pressure that's brought to bear in our communities uh, is unbelievable. Uh, but a real man of God is clear of eye, strong of voice. Uh, he is careful in purpose. Uh, he is faithful in doctrine uh, and in holy living. Uh, he speaks for God. Uh, he hears from God. And he hears for God. Uh, he takes from God to the people and takes from the people to God. Uh, that's the way that a real man of God operates. Uh, I'm going to preach to you in spite uh, of the pressure, in spite of the difficult, in spite uh, of all that hell can bring against uh, the apostolic church. Uh, God put a man, and God blesses that man, and God preserves that man. Hallelujah. 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 Don't ask me to, under, to explain it. I don't know that I can. But we don't sleep right, and we don't eat right, and, and we don't exercise right. Uh, and yet it seems like God puts it in, in our hearts uh, and preserves the man of God. Uh, I believe a great part of that is because there's a congregation uh, that every day does their part uh, in lifting up the hands of the man of God. Uh, I'm going to tell you, if you don't get anything else uh, out of what I say here this morning, uh, I pray that God will put a spirit in you uh, that every day of your life, Life, uh, you'll get down on your knees. Uh, I'm not just posturing. Uh, I'm telling you a man of God needs this. Uh, he needs somebody uh, that will call his name uh, before the Lord and say, God, today preserve my elder. I was driving down the road the other day and one of the precious ladies that has been in the congregation that I pastor since... Uh, I've been there in many years before that even. As a matter of fact, she and her husband uh, at one time went in the early and middle 1950s and into the city that I pastor in and uh, helped a man to establish a Jesus name church. The church that I pastor is not the continuation of that church, but that's how long this precious saint of God has been around. We just sent her son out to the neighboring city of Chandler in our area and are helping him right now to build a Jesus name apostolic church. Uh, this is a godly woman. And, and I was driving down the road and the phone rang and, and she said, Brother Garrett, she said, I have a few questions to ask. Uh, she asked a few questions that were so easy to answer. Favors. She wanted to know if it would be all right if she went to her grandson's graduation in, in Modesto, California. Would it be all right uh, if she went to her son's church on a Sunday morning when her eldest son came in from Mississippi? Would it be all right? Those are easy questions uh, for faithful people of God. Absolutely, sis. I want you to be a part of what God is doing in your son's life. Uh, and then she stopped and she said, Brother Garrett, I just wanted to tell you that I have been praying for you. I have been burdened for you. I have been desirous that God would add to your life strength and help. And she said, Brother Garrett, I just wanted to tell you that the preaching that you've done in the last little while has been the most anointed preaching that I believe I've ever heard in my life. Now, I don't know whether or not that's just her perception, but I'm just going to tell you that that did something for me. That made me set up a little higher. It made me feel a little stronger. It made me say, thank you, Jesus, because I believe so. Sometimes a man does his best 
preaching uh, when he's under pressure uh, and feels like he's a failure when he walks out of the pulpit. Uh, oh, my friend, uh, I'm preaching to you this morning. Uh, I said I'm preaching to you this morning. Uh, God, uh, preserve the elder. Uh, come on, Faith Tabernacle. I know you're behind your pastor. I know you love his family. I know you support them with all of your heart. Uh, but I'm telling you today, get it in your spirit. Uh, if it's not there yet, uh, get it in your spirit. Oh, God, preserve the elder. Turn to your neighbor and shake them at their hand with genuineness. Look them in the eye and say, I love my elder. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 11 speaks to us, saying, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. As the oracles of God. That, that puts fear in my heart, brethren. As the oracles of God of God as the oracle of God that puts that puts a little intimidation every time that I stand behind the sacred desk the oracle of God I believe in the Word of God is the power of life and death Amen. The Apostle Paul said that what we preach has life and it has death. It's the savor of life to them that hear us and the savor of death to them that reject us. It has life and it has death. If any man speak, he's got to speak as the oracle of God. It's got to come from God. But when it does come from God, it is so wonderful. It's like heaven on earth. We are made to sit together together in heavenly places. Uh, brethren, wasn't it something the other night uh, when Brother White began to minister? Uh, wasn't it something, church, uh, when the Spirit of God began to fall uh, upon the preaching of His Word? Uh, wasn't it amazing, uh, the feeling that we felt? Uh, it was heavenly places. Uh, I did not know how late it was. Uh, I did not care how late it was. Uh, I wasn't concerned if I was hungry or not. Uh, it was the oracle of God. Uh, I was sitting uh, in liquid Holy Ghost. Uh, I could feel the power of God. Uh, oh, church, uh, God, give us that elder. God preserve that elder. The oracle of God. The oracle of God. The oracle of God. He does not always come as your friend. Sometimes he must come as God's messenger of judgment. The man of God does not always stand with a smile. Sometimes he stands with a heavy heart. Sometimes it's that certain look in his eye. It's the lowering of his forehead. It's the beetling up of his brow. It's a certain set of his teeth and a certain clench of his jaw. And everybody kind of sits back and buckles up for takeoff. And the man of God has just come. There's something on him. There's something in him. But when he finishes, the church is better. Huh? The people of God are nearer. Huh? Amen to the Spirit of the Lord. Huh? He is the oracle of God. Huh? Amen. Amen. Huh? I feel like saying something today. I made mention of this the other night because it's been in my heart so very, very much. Uh, I pastor a young man. Uh, I'm going to be careful about this. But I pastor a young man whom came, we prayed through in probably the first or second year of the pastorate uh, of, our, of our pastorate. And uh, he is a talented man. He is one of the best bass players I have ever in my life listened to. He has been instrumental in following the Holy Ghost. He had invitations to go to, uh, uh, to Nashville and be a studio musician and to travel with a traveling band. His sister has connections in Nashville, wrote a song that recently went to number two in the country western charts. And this young man has, has resisted all of that faithfully. No, I'm living for God. No, I'm going to serve the Lord. But he started missing church here a few days, uh, uh, weeks, and, and maybe just a couple months ago. I got worried about it. I started calling him on the telephone. I started worrying about him not being in the house of God. What's going on in this man's life? Uh, what's happening in his life? Uh, one night I stepped out of church uh, and I went to the telephone and I called him right during church. Uh, and he answered the phone because he wasn't 
anticipating the pastor to call. And he said, I am really surprised that you called. Uh, amen. Uh, I've noticed that before an engine quits, uh, it starts missing. You ever notice that? And before a saint of God ever backslides, they start missing. So I talked to him, and I picked up in his spirit a criticism, a criticism of me as the pastor, a little critical innuendo, not you personally, Brother Garrett, but the preaching is too loud in our church, and, and my girls, I'm worried that they're going to have uh, hearing problems. I, I listened to that. I took it all in. I was patient. I let him, I let him spill it all, and, and then I said to him, that is not your real problem. Your real problem is you've begun to criticize uh, the ministry. I'm going to tell you something today, church. Uh, I feel this in the Holy Ghost. Uh, if the devil ever allows you uh, or your flesh ever entices you uh, to develop a critical attitude uh, towards the ministry, uh, to where you feel like that you can set uh, as judge and jury, uh, prosecutor and defender uh, of God's called ministry, uh, I'm going to tell you something. You are all on your way up to a reprobate mind. If the preaching of the Word has got to be filtered uh, to your opinion, uh, oh my God, uh, about the Word of God uh, and about the person of that pastor, uh, honey, you're on your way uh, out of the church. I found out in my experience you're better off, Brother Purdue, just to say goodbye. First little hint. Uh, because it's very, very rare that they ever can recover themselves, Elder. Uh, amen. Oh, God, don't let that be true in this house. Uh, I don't know why it's not in my notes to say. I don't know why I'm saying that. Uh, oh, God, don't let that be true in this house. Uh, don't let that be true in this house. Uh, well, there's anybody uh, that would be so arrogant uh, against the things of God uh, that you would be a person. Uh, capable uh, of criticizing the ministry. Lift your hands and pray right now for yourself. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. Let's pray for ourselves. God. Give me an open heart to the ministry. Give me an open spirit, God, to your preaching. God, give me a heart of devotion to the man you put in my life. God, preserve the elder in my life. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. Here several years ago, I got very, very burdened for my pastor. And uh, even though I'm pastoring and have been gone from the local church almost 20 years, I still greatly honor and respect my pastor. And if he called me tomorrow and, and, and gave me instruction, I am telling you before God I would hear it and I would do my dead level best to be obedient to it. Uh, but I got burdened. I just got so heavy. I don't know what was on me. I don't know what was on him. I have no idea. But I remember Brother Purdue one night, almost midnight. I, I, I couldn't sleep, and I was pacing the floor. I sat down in, in the middle of the floor in, in that house, and I was so troubled and so burdened, and I was weeping for my pastor. I was, just, I was burdened for the man of God. I don't know what was going on. I have no clue. I don't suspect any sin. You understand? I don't suspect any problems, but I was burdened. I was troubled. I was worried. I, I, I need to pray for the elder in my life. But, and I sat there on the floor, and I wept and wept and wept and wept and wept. Uh, Psalmist David said, if the foundations be destroyed, uh, what shall the righteous do? Uh, if the man of God in our lives is ever destroyed, uh, what are we going to do? do? Where are we going to turn if the ministry cannot be touched of God? And if we cannot get a burden for the elder and pray for the man of God and somehow the devil slips up on his blind side and snatches him out of our life, what are we going to do? You're looking at a man I would hazard my life for the man of God in my life. 
I would jeopardize my existence uh, for my pastor. Uh, amen. Brother Purdue, I love you to death. Uh, I love you. I will do anything uh, to help you. Uh, there was a night, I, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, uh, but there was a recent time uh, when this great man of God, I was sitting in my study uh, on a Sunday afternoon as God is my witness uh, with my hands uh, uh, folded over my face and I was rocking like this and I was crying uh, and I was saying, God, I need an answer. Uh, I got to have an answer. Uh, and as I, as I was there, the phone rang uh, and I never answered the phone on Sunday afternoon. Uh, but I picked up the phone and it was your pastor. Uh, and he said, God woke me up out of a sound sleep uh, and God gave me a vision uh, and God showed me where you were uh, and God dealt with me uh, and thus saith the Lord. Uh, and it came to pass exactly uh, as this man of God said it would. Oh, Brother Purdue. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Is this all right? Can I preach a little longer? It won't offend you. Lamentation chapter 5 and verse 14 tells us, the elders ceased from the gate. The elders, the elder, the elders, the elders ceased from the gate. The man of God, the elder, the man with wisdom, the man with judgment, the man with a clear eye, the man with a pure heart, the man with a heartbeat of God, the elder ceased from the gate. In the book of Lamentations, chapter number 1 and verse number 9, this is the position and the condition of the people of God. This is the city of Jerusalem as God was looking at it. Her filthiness is in her skirts. She remembereth not her last end. Therefore she came down wonderfully. She had no comforter. O Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy hath magnified himself. The adversary hath spread out his hand upon all her pleasant things, for she hath seen that the heathen entered into her sanctuary. I don't know what that does to you, but I'm going to tell you what it does to me. The heathen hath entered into her sanctuary sanctuary, uh, the place where oblation was made, uh, the place where sacrifice was made, uh, the place where prayer was heard, uh, the place where godly men and godly women could feel safe. Uh, but the degeneration of Israel is so acute uh, that the Bible said the heathen uh, have entered into her sanctuary. Uh, how bad does it have to get? Uh, how bad does it have to get? Let the heathen feel at home huh, in the sanctuary of God. How rotten can the conditions be huh, that the heathen feel justified and no fear, no intimidation in the house of God. The heathen entered into a sanctuary whom thou didst command that, that they should not enter into thy sanctuary. Uh, the prophet said, God said, don't ever let them in. Uh, the prophet said, God said, uh, keep them out. Uh, you better thank God every day of your life uh, for a man that keeps the heathen out, uh, that keeps sin out, uh, that keeps Trinitarianism out, uh, that keeps unrighteousness out. Uh, you better thank God for a man that's so conscientious. I said you ought to thank God for a man that's so conscientious to the will and the spirit of God that the heathen are not welcome and do not feel comfortable. Uh-huh. I feel like I'm preaching in the Holy Ghost right now. I feel like I'm dealing with some spirits of opposition here this morning. 
Uh huh. I've got your number. You're pegged, friend. Uh, amen. How bad does it have to get uh, for the heathen to be in the sanctuary? Uh, all her people sigh. They seek bread. Uh, they have given their pleasant things for meat uh, to relieve the soul. Uh, oh, people, <laughs> they come into the house of God, they come because their soul is so hungry for the things of God. They're so interested. They are so sick of the world. They are so sick of the things of sin. And they come looking, searching, is there anything better than what I have? And they can find it in the sanctuary of God. A pastor, a good man. His name is Keith Negby. He is a wonderful man. He's Trinidadian. He is a very tall and very strong man. And uh, uh, he has that, that British Trinidadian accent uh, from the Caribbean islands. Uh, he lived in the streets of New York City. He was a drug runner and drug pusher on the streets of Detroit. Uh, and somehow... God got a hold of his life uh, and brought him to the city of Phoenix, Arizona. And, and one day driving down the street, uh, he saw the church and its doors opened. Uh, and he said to his wife, we are going to church right now. And she said, I don't want to go. And he said, okay, I'm going. And he went to church uh, and he sat on the back pew. Uh, but she came late and he left early. Uh, but I noticed he came back the next Sunday morning. Morning. Uh, and this time he wept. Uh, he came back the third Sunday morning. Uh, he brought his wife uh, and they prayed. Uh, he came back the fourth Sunday morning uh, and he prayed through to the baptism uh, of the Holy Ghost. He is one of the stoutest men that I know. He is a master in the martial arts. Uh, he is like whipcord iron. He is so strong. Uh, amen. A few days ago, a man, uh, obviously under the influence and, and obviously in trouble, uh, came to our services and created a ruckus. And, and so I did what all pastors do. I, I walked back and, and I just put my arm around the, the man and talked to him. Uh, and he was shoving other people and slapping people and devilish fist at others. Uh, and they ready to, to, to tussle. And, and I walked back, put my arm around him, and talked to him a while. I, but old brother Keith Negby saw that. I, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw him crouched I, between the pews. I, he was looking at that man with that steely look. I, he was looking at him, I, saying, you make one move towards my pastor, I, and I'll tear you in two. I, that's the kind of man that he is. I, amen. I, amen. I, but when he came to the house of God... I, he was seeking relief for his soul. He was seeking rest for his spirit. He was tired of the world. One day he got me by the arm. You got to see him. He's bigger than I am. And he got me by the arm. And uh, you'll allow me, Elder, I will not. I will not. I will, anyway, I'm a little intimidated around these great men of God. But, but he got me by the arm and he took his right fist up and he started hitting me in the arm. Just hit me in the arm. Hit me in the arm. You said, I would hit my pastor. Well, I hope you don't. Uh, but you just got to understand the circumstances of that moment. Uh, he was just hitting me in the arm. Tears were falling off his face. Uh, stripping, streaking down his cheeks. Uh, they were splashing onto my clothing, and I started weeping with him. Uh, and he said, Pastor, Pastor, Pastor. He said, Pastor, I used to dream about having a dog and having a recliner. And he said, Pastor, and he's hit me in the arm. Hit me in the arm. He said, Pastor, I have two dogs and I have two recliners. God has been so good to me. You say, so what? 
You don't understand what I'm preaching about. And he began, he kept hitting me in the arm, and he said in his Trinidadian accent, You a bad lad, Pastor. You a bad lad, Pastor. You a bad lad, Pastor. He got that in the house of God. He got that in the house of God. All the people sigh. They seek bread. They have given their present uh, uh, things for meat to relieve the soul. See, O oh Lord, and consider, for I have become vile. And then he says, Is it nothing to you, O oh, ye that pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. This man of God is broken. He is so he is so broken. That he said, everybody passing by, have you ever seen the sorrow? Has there ever been as much grief expressed as I am expressing? I read to you the conditions of the house of God. But I read to you that it concludes and says that the elders ceased in the gate. If the elders ever cease, this place will become occupied by every grievous demonic influence that you can imagine. Amen. If the elder ever ceases, it will become a haunted, empty, desolate place. Oh, God, preserve the elder. God, preserve the elder. God, preserve the elder. God, keep him preaching. God, give him health. God, give him wisdom. God, deal with his life. God, preserve the elder. The elder ever ceases. We are in trouble. As an apostolic movement, we are in trouble. We are in trouble. We are in trouble. We are in trouble. Oh, God. Oh, God. I love these men of God. I love these men that have been here this week. I love those that have preached. I love my pastor. I love the elders in the apostolic church. I'm not fighting against the elders. I'm wanting to hold the elders close because the elders must not cease. If the elder ever ceases in your life, you're going to weep like Jeremiah wept. And you're going to cry like Jeremiah cried. I'm closing. Just a week and a half ago, I got a phone call. I was leaving for a youth conference that we and several other churches are sponsoring. And a man said, Pastor, the worst that you can imagine has happened to my life. I am desperate to talk to you. And I please... And he came by. I met him at the church. Nobody was there but he and I. We sat down for a long time. I didn't make it that day. Didn't get to hear the preaching that day. I sat there and he poured his heart out. He has done the unthinkable. If your mind can conjure the worst, it's what he is guilty of. A few days later, his family came. His son is 19 years of age, a freshman at Arizona State University. And the boy sat down in a chair. His wife was sobbing uncontrollably. The boy was sitting there, humiliated, embarrassed. And he looked at me and he said, and these words will haunt me the rest of my life. He said, the reason that I quit coming to church is because I was afraid that every time that you preached and every time that you looked at me, you could see my sin and you could see my shame. And I just couldn't take it. And so the entire family left the house of God. Brother Purdue, I am helpless. I don't have any hope. I don't even know what to do. I don't even know what to say. I don't even know how to advise. I don't know where to go. But I know there was a day on a Sunday morning, the last Sunday morning they were there. I'll never forget it. I was preaching with such a burden, such a and I pointed at that man. I was preaching. I was walking down the aisle of a full house. 
And I remember pointing at him and saying, if you don't get your sin under control, if you don't come to an altar and repent, your sin is going to destroy you. And your sin is going to be shouted on the rooftop. Here we are, about four years later. And it's horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. Folks, pray. Seek God. Mean it from your heart. God, preserve the elder. Give Him access to your life. Give Him access to your heart. Give Him access to your will. And pray, God, preserve the elder. Let Him guide you with His eye. Let Him hear from God. And when He preaches, respond to God. God, preserve the elder. I remember stepping up on the platform. Somebody come to the instruments, please. I remember stepping on the platform and in my shoes. I was there to lead songs that night for my pastor. The shoes had a little gold emblem in the back of the heel. Just a little gold emblem. And I remember stepping up on that platform and I saw my pastor's eyes just do that. That's all he did. He just did that. Something smoked. I couldn't hardly lead songs. I couldn't hardly stand there. And as soon as I got a chance, as soon as that service was over, I went home. I got me a screwdriver. And I remodeled those shoes. You know why? He didn't have to say anything to me. I don't know if he ever would have said anything to me. My pastor doesn't wear a wristwatch. He never preached it. He has no conviction. He just is uncomfortable with a wristwatch. But Brother Purdue, I cannot put a wristwatch on and wear it to the pulpit. I can't. I can't. I can't. Say, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. No, you don't understand. That's my elder. That's my shepherd. That's the man of God. And it makes him uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable. I don't have to have a conviction. I just want God to preserve the elder in my life. I want God to give me a shepherd after his heart who will guide me, who will teach me, who will lead me in the way. God, preserve the elder. Stand to your feet if you would. Lift your hand with closed eyes and begin to call on the Lord. There's a tender spirit here right now. There's a tender spirit. There's a tender touch of God. In the name of Jesus. 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 And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua, which had seen the mighty works of the hand of God. I don't know if we can sing something appropriate, but I'm going to ask this church, I'm going to ask every person in this auditorium, without exception, without exception, I want you to begin to gather as close as you can get to the front of this building. Don't kneel. Come and stand. There's not enough room to kneel. I want everybody. And we're going to pray. Come on. I don't care where you're seated. Come on. That's it. That's it. Somebody help those children come. God, preserve the elder. Pray. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your life. Pray for your heart. Pray for your spirit. It doesn't matter.
That's it. 